Hello, and welcome to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, many other postings. How are you this fine March day, Bill? Yeah, I'm kind of torn, Seth. I'm kind of happy to wrap this up, Masters of the Air. On the other hand, I wish... They had done so much more that it would have been great to cover even more episodes. But this is it. Last episode. Indeed. Indeed. And joining us uh, again, as he has for all of these episodes, is director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum, my good buddy, Tommy Lofton. Tommy, how are you this fine March 18th? I am great. How are you guys? Just peachy. Doing Just fine. <laughs> peachy. And as I've done with all of these, Bill, it's your show. All right. So, guys... Here we are. The, the title of this episode uh, for the producers from the producer standpoint should have been Operation Recover from Nosedive. The question is <laughs> going to be, how have they done it? And bottom line up front, I think they did, kind of. And we'll get into that. So we open on February 3rd, 1945, with thousands of planes over Germany. At this point in the war, they're flying uncontested. But the first thing I noticed in CGI land was these B-17s look different. And if I'm not mistaken, they had chin turrets when they shouldn't have. Um, was I right on that, guys? Other, other way around, they should have had chin turrets and they didn't. Um, the uh, the I knew what you were stabbing at there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got it backwards. Yeah, no, I yeah. knew what you were driving at. But um, yeah, so I mean... Truth be told, were they still flying B-17F models in 1945? Yeah, absolutely. But the the G model, which is the one with the chin turret, was far and away the more prevalent model in 1945 than, than the F model. And they were, lack of a better term, silver. Uh, they were not mm -hmm. necessarily worried about the camouflage anymore that you see earlier in the war, 43, and even in the early 44 when they were green. And actually, even before that, they were actually camouflaged. Um, but in 45, they didn't really care anymore mm -hmm. about trying to conceal their whereabouts. Um, but, you know, th that's a little bit misleading when they said it was they, that the 8th Air Force was flying uncontested. That's not true. Uh, they they did get plenty of air action in 1945. Uh, it wasn't as frequent. And um, but it was most certainly there. The Germans were most certainly up in the air. Not every raid, but when they made their presence known, they made their presence known in 45. Mm -hmm. But that's besides the point. Yep. So they're on their way to Berlin. Rockets are incoming. And here we have a big surprise. Um, unless you're you know your history, then you would know that yes, this is Rosie's airplane. Engine one on fire. There are bombs away. They the bomb at bombardiers. And one of the airplanes, the the bombardier's nose area was hit. And basically, it's a big funnel now with the nose cone gone, you know, and wind coming through the airplane at that point. The deputy uh, commander is taking the lead. And and um, I think the Rosie at this point was a squadron commander, wasn't he? I believe so. Yes, I think that's I think right. So. Yeah. yeah. And, and I so, want to point out really quickly before we get further in the Rosie story, I didn't notice finally that we have a mission. Of course, we hadn't been in the air really in the last two episodes that we have a mission where you can see close last fighters. Three. Last three, you're right. Uh, you know, with the P-51s right there off the wings of the B-17s flying uh, cover and flying close formation. To count rivets a little bit, what's unfortunate is the markings on the Mustangs that they have are actually for fighters in the 15th Air Force with the 31st Fighter Group, which would have been nowhere... Mm -hmm near flying <laughs> and they would not have had the blue checkerboard pattern but that's me being uh extremely anal here they would have had basically red diagonal stripes on their tails and and just red noses but uh from from the research that i was able to do it looked like that was the wrong markings on the airplane but it was a beautiful shot to have it close by and be able to see it it was uh, and i will say that we we got a lot of comments about the fact that this occurred the filming of this occurred during covid and there were a whole bunch of cost cutting measures because they had to pay the crew when they couldn't film so they had to cut costs in other areas and i think they probably had a single model of those p51s yeah. in the computer oh, yeah. 
We yeah. were using that model. The same thing with the B-17s. Sure. They were using models, computer-generated models, uh -huh. that wouldn't have been appropriate to, to the sequence that we're watching. Right. But again, man, one of many cost-cutting measures, we'll talk about more that, that more at the end of this review. So yeah, It's just me being picky uh, and... and no, no, it's good. 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 That's what this story is <laughs> But I like it. To do. I still like the They're fact that they finally to. show, you know, Mustangs escorting 17s in, in a way that yeah. the whole reason they were there, you know. The whole reason they were invented. Good. All right. So, yes, indeed, it's Rosie's plane that's on fire. It's got an oxygen fire. Rosie, they, the, he, they bail out. Rosie's by himself. Um, he, the, the plane crashes and he sees the plane, the fire explosion. Um, he, he has a hard time bailing out, actually. His chute's open. It's snowing. Um, when he lands, he's hurt. And it looked to me like he had a dislocated shoulder. And I haven't read enough about Rosie to know if that's what the issue was. But, of course, he hears soldiers on the ground, and he's worried he's about to be captured by the Germans. He pulls out his pistol, fumbles with it because he can't use his shooting hand, has to use the left hand. And because of his shoulder injury, and uh, turns out they're Russians, which is good news for Rosie. Indeed, and that, of course, what what you're seeing here is is his last mission. That's his fifty second mission, and I said that right, fifty two, fifty two missions, um, in the Eighth Air Force and the Hundred Five Group, which is friggin' incredible. But yeah, yeah, I mean, from everything that 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 you just spoke about bill yeah that's pretty much how it happened i don't know if he dislocated his shoulder or if he fractured his arm or whatever but him being hurt like that is a real deal the real deal because if you look at pictures of him when he gets back well i'm not spoiling anything when he gets back yeah his arm is in a sling so it, mm -hmm. it is that is definitely um a thing that that he did definitely hurt himself um i don't know if he when it bailed out or when he hit the ground or whatever it doesn't frankly it doesn't matter but i will say this um that scene of that airplane getting hit and him getting out or trying to get out that was i think one of the better action sequences in this entire series it was mm -hmm. uh made the old heart i mean you know what happens but it made the old heart race mm -hmm. and i've said that before if you know the story and you know what happens and you're still like ooh, i wonder what's going to happen that's a sign of good filmmaking or if in the case of a book, that's a sign of good writing or whatever the case may be. And, and that mm -hmm. is, that is a clear sign that um, this episode was, was going down a far different path than the last two episodes had. And that made me uh, feel good. You know, made me feel yeah, good. I, I thought so too. I thought the, uh, the whole sequence of seeing the bombs drop and everything else was pretty, pretty cool and how they did that. And I'm glad they saved it. You know, some may argue they should have done more of that earlier in the show, I'm kind of glad they waited till they got to Berlin to do it. And that's the only thing I would say, too, that I, I didn't care for as much about the setup for this episode is there's no context. There's no, mm -hmm. I mean, all you understand is you're flying over Berlin, but there's no, hey, we're about to, again, bomb the snot out of the civilians. And, and there's not a lot of uh, a real setup for where we're at in the war, what's going on, and and especially because you haven't seen a briefing or any kind of information in several episodes now, truthfully. Uh, I just think it would have been nice to have a little bit more backstory on February of 45, where are we at in the war, and, and how is it a little different than the last time you saw us flying airplanes? There's a whole lot of context that's missing from <laughs> yeah. several of these episodes that would make it uh, make more sense. And it, again, from a context of um, there's stuff in here they didn't need to put in and there's stuff in here that I think would have made it better that they did. I mean, that's going to be a typical correct uh, co complaint, I think. Sure, sure. One thing, yeah, one thing I do want to say parenthetically, though, is we had a commenter say that, oh, we didn't like episode seven and eight because they were directed by a woman. Frankly, I did not know they were directed by a woman. It's like that either. comment. And I went back and looked. And it turns out some of the episodes we loved were also directed by a woman. So it has nothing to yeah, do with that's, it. That's, that's, that's just somebody being an idiot. That's not germane to this. Yeah. Hell, I wrote a master's thesis on women in the American Red Cross in World War II in Europe. So I yeah. don't don't play the sexist card. Come on. Yeah. It had no nothing to do stuff. with that. It was that they were horrible horribly directed they were episodes, garbage. horribly written they were garbage yeah. they were yep good 
All right, since we got that out of the way, we jumped to this. There was a title sequence. Then we jumped to the Stalag. And um, so this, the, the point is made very well clear that they're going to have to march from the Stalag they've been in, which is run by the Luftwaffe, to a new Stalag. So the, 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 the prisoners, the POWs, correctly surmised that the Allies must be close. They said, put on your warmest gear, only essentials. Now, we have an astute viewer who <laughs> commented um, afterwards that the, the apparently the, the directors and the costumers for this episode didn't know how to wear a war what's called a great coat, because many of these guys were wearing great coats. And uh, Michael from Canada, historian uh, extraordinaire, you were correct. It's just... If you're that cold, you're going to do things. You're going to use the coat the way it's designed to use. Silly Power little up. point. I get it, but but it would be re more realistic if they did that, guys. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot I of mean, people with frozen faces and frozen ears in reality if they wear the stuff the way that they're showing it in the show. You know, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. So they're walking through the snow in the German countryside. Yeah, like you said, frozen faces as if we didn't get the message through the fact that there's snow, frost, and, and frozen people and horses on the ground. They put a blue filter on the camera lens to make it look colder. I always laugh at things like that. But anyway, uh, Bucky's getting sick, and, you know, for whatever reason, he's got a fever. And then they cut right back to England. They're doing, it's not as bad as episodes seven and eight with the music video cuts, the 30-second the sometimes even less than that, cuts between scenes. This one's a little bit more established before they cut, but it's still way too fast to develop the storyline in each location. So now we see Crosby is being informed that Rosie has gone down. He's got his gear locker. Um, they, you know, they say no parachutes. And so at this point, I, get, I have to believe that they believe that Rose... Uh, Rosenberg is dead. Is that what was happening here, guys? Yeah, I mean, Rosen it, it, yeah, Rosenthal. We, yeah, but mm -hmm. um, again, it was a it was a thing. You know, if they didn't come back, they didn't know if they were alive or dead, and it was just assumed that they were goners that 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 they did not make it back. And and Rosenthal's Rosie's, and I know you're going to get to it, but I mean, his his I don't want to call it an escape story, but his uh, the way he gets back to Thorpe Abbotts is freaking incredible and and they his do return. a pretty good job huh? Huh? <laughs> his return story yes yeah and they mm -hmm. do a pretty good job of it here it's it's amazing it really is right the russians treat him quite well after they capture yeah. him yeah. but we don't get to even see that yet because we're back with the POWs in the road to moscow they've walked 48 miles at this point in i think two or three days um and so, you know, again, they're cold, dead horse, dead people, German soldiers falling, and American POW helps a German sergeant who's struggling on this walk. Um, they have to get off the road. Vehicles are passing by. The German guards are doing the Heil Hitler thing to the German soldiers, and the German soldiers do not return the salute. And one of them comments that it's children and old men, therefore, all must be lost. Um, that, you know, this whole sequence, there's this, engineers have this thing where you've got an input and an output, and then they draw a cloud on a whiteboard saying, a miracle happens here. <laughs> this whole sequence gave me that idea because they're they're doing end to end stuff. A whole lot of things happen in the middle, but they're skipping all that because now we see them warming over a fire, and and say you know, um, well, and it's know, not lost say, on me too that the the soldier who mm -hmm. was being uh, over the top with Helped. Heil Hitler and all this other stuff was a young man. It was H. J. Uh, who was very idealized in his rhetoric throughout this episode, even when they're leaving the camp and he's talking about how you deal with the Schweinen. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not lost on me that the older sergeants and everyone else see the writing on the wall, and I think that's partially why they they did that sequence that way. As you see the old guy saying, "You know, all this is for nothing." Basically, this this war is lost if when he sees all the young men and and the old men going off to the uh, front lines. Uh, and then you see that idealized, brainwashed, raised in the Third Reich. You know, we're still 
we're still going to win this. And it's no, no, mm-hmm. you're not. Um, I, I agree. I, I really like that scene um, because, and yeah, Bill, to your point, hundred percent, they've skipped over a lot, but I mean, yeah, you know, kind of is what it is at this point, but <clears throat> I agree 100%, yeah. to Tommy, that the way they covered that I thought was very good is you got your your grizzled guys who've been around the block and they're like, this is a bunch of malarkey. And they, I mean, you listen to anybody that was in Germany in 1945, any American or Brit, but I mean, from our experience, obviously more Americans, they'll tell you that the most dangerous people on the planet in 1945 in Germany were the HJs. They were the Hitler Jugend. It was not the Wehrmacht and even the SS. Because the HJ who would, you know, they were fanatics to the core because they were brainwashed, like you said. So I thought that was very well done. I I actually liked that a lot. I uh, (laughs) noticed in the background, too, and if you go back, if you didn't see it and you go back and watch it at some point, you'll notice lots of young men with Panzerfausts and Mm -hmm. and just throwaway equipment, uh, sort of one shot, one kill type of equipment that Mm -hmm. you'll see in there. And it it took me back to I interviewed a, a, a werewolf at one point, not the literary version but the uh german version of the, of the hitler youth that were designed to especially come after american tanks you know hide in the woods you see this a little bit in the movie fury as well uh where mm-hmm. they've literally trained these young men these boys here take this Panzerfaust or or rifle and run toward the americans and shoot and try to kill as many as you can before you're killed um mm-hmm. The main reason that the one that I interviewed survived is his grandfather actually locked him in the cellar, if I remember correctly, wouldn't let him out when the Americans came close by and it saved his life. Uh, but it, it took me back to that kind of watching that sequence and seeing those young boys with the, the Panzerfaust slung over their shoulders and heading heading to the front lines. Yeah, I thought it was well done. Yep. I have to point out, though, that Fury was written and directed by my friend David Ayer, and I went to the premiere. Um, mm. Parenthetical. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, I had a really good movie. So getting back, there's an exchange between Buck and Bucky as they're walking, saying not exactly how we thought it would go. Huh? And the other one said, not exactly. I wasn't planning on getting shot down for one. This is where they talk about if there were two lat planes still flying, it would be you and me. Now, one of our commenters said that he pulled out of Crosby's book that a Crosby believed that Buck and Bucky were a major defect in the early flights in the hundredth because they were loosey goosey in their tactics and formations. Um, do you know anything about that guys? Yes, I do. I, I've read Crosby's book twice and it's been several years since I've read it again. And I've thumbed through it a little bit here as we've gone through some of these things, but yeah, Crosby was Crosby. And, and this is part of the problem that we had at the beginning of this series is that, you know, they portrayed him as going pile, and obviously he's not any longer, but if you read his book, which I suggest you do if you haven't, it's very good. Uh, he was like a professional. He was by the book all the time. And one of his biggest um, criticisms of the group that he was a part of in 1943 and even before was the fact that they were loosey-goosey. And, and they had a reputation for that. They Not just the two Buckies, but, but the hundredth had a reputation for being a loosey-goosey, very... Uh, devil may care kind of outfit they had that reputation in the states before they ever even went to europe and then maintained that reputation when they got to europe so it it wasn't until and i think i said this last week it wasn't until tom jeffries uh and again they were blessed with good commanders their entire time but tom jeffries specifically came in and whipped the unit into shape literally in like a weekend and from then on oh from then on for the rest of the war they consistently performed among the best if not the best uh bomb groups in the entire eighth air force and it was mainly due to to jeffries but yeah that whole lax attitude stemmed from those two guys really started from them and continued Mm -hmm. because they had so much influence over everybody else because they were these you know white scarf wearing you know (laughs) barnstorming looking pilots because that's Mm -hmm. who they were that's who they were but yeah, well, did, that's right. Did the producers then err in making those two kind of the focal points, at least no. in the early episodes? No, no, I don't think so, because because they were, I mean, again, if you go back and you read anything about the 100th mm-hmm. in the early days by any of the guys that were there, be it Frank Murphy, he's got a book, or he had a book out, Crosby and, and, and Cowboy Roan had a book. They all talk about those two guys, those two mm-hmm. guys, you know, Don Miller's book, which is sitting right here in my desk. 
those two guys were the heart and soul of the 100th bomb group from its formation in the United States until they got shot down. And then once they got shot mm -hmm. down, it was out of sight, out of mind, you know, for the most part. Okay. Well, I'm glad they we were legends. That. Legends for legends, sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we are with the POWs as they march to Stalag 13, I think it was in Nuremberg. And they show Nuremberg being completely bombed out, which I think is accurate yeah. at this point in the war. Um, George Nighthammer sees Buck. And so there's, they're, they're connected with more of their uh, not, group mates, not squadron mates necessarily. And then we cut to Rosie in Poland. Well, hang on. Um, actually, I think George uh, that he runs into was actually a friend of his from from back from, home because he started yeah. talking about really? baseball and some other. Yeah, I, that yeah. was my mm -hmm. uh, understanding was that he was uh, actually from back home and and not uh, necessarily a member of the hundredth. Yeah, correct. Okay. He was he wasn't a hundredth uh, century bomber. He was either either from the same area that Clevin lived in, or at least they trained together in the United States, but they were not in the same unit. Yeah, I kind of thought mm -hmm. they were like. Buddies from and they college in Wyoming yeah. or something, but yeah. but um, it seemed like a, a hometown thing, and uh, yeah, yep. Okay, so we cut to Rosie in Poland, he's on a vehicle actually riding with a general, and and there's a conversation going on, they have to stop, and the general's covering his nose, saying we have to do this for the smell. They stop to clear an obstacle in the road. Rosie says, Mind, mind if I stretch my legs. And he walks to a gate, and it is uh, Zabikowo concentration camp. And he walks through the concentration camp around it, sees piles and piles of bodies inside the barracks. There's a Hebrew saying written on the wall that, that translated to the judge of life will judge for life, which I'm, I did some research on that. And as far as I can tell, it's a Jewish saying it essentially means just desserts. It is not Hebrew scripture, but it was a very poignant series of shots of Rosie walking through. And of course, at this point, he understands the gravity of the situation they're in, and um, and this jumping ahead of uh, you know several months is one of the things that motivates him to come back for the Nuremberg trials. But that's after the war is over. So ideas on this scene. Guys, so yeah, I don't think that actually happened. I'll be honest with you. Okay. The way the way they obviously, I'm not going to say anything about the Holocaust. So don't any idiot take that the wrong way. I'm talking about the scene with Rosenthal. Um, I don't think that that happened in the way that they portrayed it. Shall we say? Um, mm -hmm. I think by this time in the war, uh, it was still being discovered, as they showed. You know, but I I was just looking, literally just now looking to see if I could find any kind of uh, reference to that happening, like to Rosie actually going into a camp like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he didn't, but I don't think he did. Tommy, do you, did, were you able to? No, I, I was kind of uh, struggling to find anything connecting to him actually going into a camp, but I yeah, have no doubt he was saying. fully aware of sure. what was going on at this point in the war and especially being Jewish as well. You know, it, mm -hmm. to me, it was kind of a, uh, uh, a storyline connecting maybe even to his post-war life uh, and, and trying to tie in that Holocaust. You know, we saw it on a bunch of uh, presumably Jewish people on a train at one point in the early POW right. uh, sequence. And I think some of this was just still tied into uh, we haven't lost this story arc of the of the Holocaust. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I agree. But yeah. the, the interesting thing is they name a specific camp, which is Zabikoa. And, you know, one of the Russian Russians who's with um, Rosie, Rosie in this scene says, we found many of these camps. Everyone was dead before we arrived. It's clear that they were built for killing many, many people, Poles and Russians, mostly Jews. And, of course, one of the executive producers of the series is Steven Spielberg, who made not only one of the you know, the best Holocaust movie ever made, arguably, but one of the best movies ever made in Schindler's List. And so, you know, I can understand they would want to treat that issue in some way in this series, certainly. Um, there's a conversation that Rosie has with a, an old man 
where he says that he's, he buried his wife, his daughter's grandchildren with his own hands. And Rosie asks him, where are you going to go now? And he says, Palestina. And Rosie says, go, go with God. And then the old man says, God, if God exists, he has forgotten me, which is interesting. Um, not, um, it's understandable, but it's yeah. an interesting way to close that scene out. So again, they put so many specifics in the scene that intimate that this really happened. It would be disappointing if it didn't, because then it becomes trivialized, in my view. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> again, I wish I had, on Friday, uh, I got a phone call that I hadn't, that I wasn't expecting for many reasons, not the least of which is I haven't spoken to him in years. I was standing in my kitchen and my phone rang in my pocket and it was none other, ironically enough, than Dan Rosenthal, Rosie's son. And he called mm -hmm. me to talk uh, about the documentary. He obviously watched it and he saw yours truly on there. And he wanted to talk about that and just about the series in general. So I found out some some pretty interesting things about how they filmed some of these episodes from Dan because he was there. And um, I hadn't watched the episode yet. I wished I'd had <laughs> because I'd asked Dan straight up. You would ask him. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I would have hey, did he really do this? And unfortunately, I uh, I couldn't get a hold of him on Saturday. I he, I found out later he was out of town. He was doing doing something. But uh, yeah, I wish I'd I wish I'd watched the episode Thursday because I totally would have asked him. Did your dad really do this? Because I'm fairly certain mm -hmm. he did not. But I understand mm -hmm. the context of why they put it in there. You know, they're mm -hmm. trying to to hit the to to drive the nail home. I get it, and and I think it works. Frankly, I really do. From a filmmaking aspect, I think it works, but historically i'm fairly certain that rosie did not uh was not exposed to that was he aware of it yeah probably so but did he mm -hmm. actually walk through a camp like that i don't think so all right well cut back to the prisoners the pow's and they're walking again and marching again because they're worried that the um allies are close again so road to bavaria yeah. that's where they're headed now Guys are starting to break out into groups because they think this whole business is going to fall apart. A P-51 comes in and strafes them. Um, somebody says they're mad at the Germans, but some of the Americans seem to have been killed too. Uh, I suspect things like this did happen as well, guys. Yeah, I mean, were, were POW columns strafed by roving American or allied aircraft? Yeah, absolutely. So were POW trains. Uh, you know, they were shot up all the time. Um, and Tommy, uh, you you know more about this than I do, but I'm fairly certain P-51s were not night fighters. So the, the fact that a 51 is going to be zooming around in the middle of the night, strafing a torch lit column, I find very, very difficult to believe. But regardless, Bill, to answer your question, did this sort of thing happen? Heck yeah, unfortunately, all too often, frankly, because those guys that were in the air were told to shoot anything that moved on the ground. And that included horse and mm -hmm. wagons or whatever the case, owls, you know, I mean, and they literally did that. I mean, because they were trying to do anything that could hurt the German war machine. If they're going to see a herd of people moving down the road, they don't know who the hell that is. All they see is just from, you know, 15,000 feet is a column of human beings and they're like oh here we go so yeah that absolutely would have happened at night like that mm, i don't know mm -hmm. yeah it it's not i don't know too many other uh instances outside of d-day where p-51s are flying too frequently any fighters at night or yeah any fighters unless they were you know specifically night fighters which we didn't have a ton of that in world war ii but uh it is totally plausible and possible that they saw a column thought it was german soldiers because there were german soldiers moving all over the area as well Absolutely. um and the idea was to try to get the enemy to end this war as quickly as possible so uh not not against the uh you know it's not outside of the realm of possibilities for sure okay well, this is the moment where Buck and Bucky decide they're going to make a run for it because the discipline in this group is falling down. They think they can get out without anybody noticing. So them and two other guys, George and Bill, uh, run to go over a wall. Three of them make it. Bucky does not. He's caught and tackled and beat up a bit. They're, they shoot at, at Bucky, George and Bill, but they do not hit them. So they're running off into who knows where at this point. 
when we yeah. cut to Bucky, there's there's a shot of a white horse, an injured white horse walking down the road. And I was reminded of Steven Spielberg's World War One movie at this point called War Horse. I would say not one of his best movies. Um, and then the three guys who did make it, Bucky, George, and Bill, are in a forest. And one of the unlucky ones is urinating against a tree when I assume it's one of these Hitler Juden um, youths that um, bayonets him in the back. Is, was, is the uniform right for that, guys? Yeah, pretty much. Yes. Um, to, 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 to go back just a bit, that did mm -hmm. happen to an extent, you know, I don't know the names of the people that Clevin escaped with, but he did escape during this portion of the march called the March to Mooseburg is what they called it. Um, he did get away. Uh, Egan tried to get away and didn't, couldn't. Um, it's interesting to note, and I don't know if we've ever talked about this, and I know Tommy and I chatted, chatted about it. The commanding officer that you see, he's wearing a garrison cap and he's got a beard. Uh, that's Dar. It's supposed to be Dar Alker. Dar Alker was one of the first hundredth bomb group COs. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a prisoner of war camp, obviously the 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 highest ranking officer is going to be in charge. And it just so happened that it was Dar Alker who was one of the hundredth bomb groups COs, one of the earliest ones. I don't think he was the first one. He might have been the second one. Regardless, he was no, he was the first one. Fourteen November forty two through twenty five April forty three. So yeah, he um which I thought was kind of cool. And they didn't explain that at all in the mm -hmm. series that the prisoner of war CO that you see is Dar Al mm -hmm. here, who mm -hmm. was one of the hundredth bomb groups commanding officers, which is yeah, kind was, of an important thing to note, you know. It, it was kind of yeah, a lost yeah. opportunity while they're in the middle of showing Crosby, you know, with his British girlfriend for two or three episodes <laughs> straight. But you know, they could have established that uh connection much earlier you know several episodes before this one and really they didn't even establish mm -hmm. it uh, also i think the one of the guy they're showing getting stabbed i can't find that this actually happened to him in real life but it was i think Needhammer that was portrayed on the show who escaped um and that they're showing getting stabbed while he's peeing and i looked it up real quick according to the hunter bomb site uh, while y'all were talking a minute ago i was looking it up because it was bothering me Needhammer was actually with the 454th bombardment group or bomber group and he um was a close college friend of clevin it says back from mm. back home in wyoming so uh i can't find that he was actually stabbed by a hitler youth or how that how that played out i think um uh, that may have just been hollywood and what's unfortunate to me is it's also showing that they didn't run into each other where they showed in the series they were actually on the force march together and had been pow's together for quite a while uh, so mm -hmm. that's another character that it's like, why didn't they make this connection several episodes ago, you know, in the camp or, or whatever else. But, uh, I guess they waited and decided to use it somehow in this one. But to me, it would have been a little bit more, you would have been more emotionally attached to that character rather than just having seen him 15 minutes earlier and then him getting stabbed in the back or whatever while he's urinating. Well, let's continue to go down that path, um, Tommy, because he gets, I, I did not know that was his friend, George. And because it, it became, it, it was kind of odd to me that here this kid stabs him, not once, but twice, kills him. Um, and Buck lets them go because they're boys. And it turns out the gun's empty, but he still has the rifle with the bayonet on it. Um, so, you know, they, they were sent out there with empty guns, got it. This probably that probably happened, sure. But letting them go, um, you know, you're, you're trying to, you're still not, it's still not assured that you're going to make it out of this place, that you're going to escape. It, it reminds me of Lone Survivor, right, and <laughs> the trouble that 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 led into letting the people go. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I think it's a judgment call, um, maybe a moral decision. Plus, you got to remember these guys. Would have probably still mm -hmm. had to struggle with these boys, have had little to no food or have no energy. They're doing all that they can to run off of their adrenaline to escape and get back to hopefully allied lines. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that that whole sequence even happened in real life, but I think mm -hmm. it was a judgment call at the moment. It was very clear those boys were scared. The one who stabbed 
if I remember correctly, the one who stabbed George in the sequence got his, uh, either knocked out or killed, but uh, it looked like he was killed to me. But um, yeah, you know, I think part of that was that idea that maybe that they were doing what they were told to do, taught to do, and it wasn't really who they were, especially since mm -hmm. they were so young. Um, I don't know. I, I thought it was a pretty... I had the same feelings during the episode, like, man, that would be hard to to let them go because they could easily get back to someone, report where you're at, and if you don't get out of there fast enough, you're caught again or shot. Uh, but then also having known you know, or heard of stories even of uh, colleagues of mine that Seth and I used to work with that even had instances where, and, and soldiers that I interviewed as well, that said, look, these Hitler youth or young, young boys had rifles were trying to kill us too, and there were instances where we had to shoot them. I mean... Oh, yeah. Whether it was in combat or we actually hunted them down in a town. And one story one of our colleagues had was, you know, they actually found a Hitler youth with a radio hiding inside of a outdoor toilet, an outhouse uh, down in the interior of it, the bowels, if you will. Uh, and as soon as they found him hiding in there with that radio that he was calling in for for uh, to get more Americans killed, they shot him, you know, Um mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, but yeah. such is war. And if you decide to put on a uniform mm -hmm. and carry a weapon, that's that's part of it. Exactly. Uh, just real quick, we're, we probably want to accelerate a bit, but with the Rosenthal um, trip back to England, C-46 to Iran, then Al Aden, Athens, Rome, Naples, and Winston Churchill's personally personal converted B-24 to get back to England. All that happened? Yep. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> Every single bit of it. Um, Rosie was taken to Moscow, and that's where the that's where mm -hmm. his odyssey uh, began. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the the way he laid it out in the show was almost verbatim to what actually happened to the real man. And yes, he mm -hmm. did most certainly ride Winston Churchill's personal B twenty four. No lie. And that would have taken you know <laughs> weeks. <laughs> that whole trap trip you know it's not like they're, they're waiting on the tarmac for him there's going to be delays between each of those flights anyway right. so probably want to get it uh, accelerate a bit we they go back to england and um crosby finds out that his wife is pregnant and he's torn about that i suspect that's i mean one of our commenters pointed out that not only were crosby's family involved in the making of this the show but they, of course, had his book in hand and they knew all about the background and his affair and things like that. And so it's not a surprise to them. Um, still, you know, the, the whole point of being a little bit reluctant or not torn about the fact that your wife is pregnant uh, is an interesting point to make. What's I know that they're, they're way beyond developing characters at this point. This is yeah. they're closing out the series. And and I don't know why they waste time on stuff like yeah, that. Just, I didn't that. I didn't like this scene, frankly, and I felt like it was uh, sort of a waste of time. Unless we know for sure he felt that way, I thought it was weird to put it on there. The only thing I could think of to try to put a positive spin on it is he was worried, you know, she's going to have this baby and I'll still be overseas fighting in this war. <laughs> As you could tell by you know by this episode, Crosby's done. He's tired of this. He's ready for this mm -hmm. war to be over. He's been there a long time. Um, I did appreciate the uh, 12 o'clock high uh, subliminal message in the yep. background on the yep. uh, uh, fireplace mantle there. If you, you haven't mean, like, noticed that it. one right back there yeah. on my show. Oh, right there. When you're yeah. Toby, Toby mug you. back there. But yeah, um, I thought that was awesome. That was the best part of the scene <laughs> to me. And I frankly uh, watched it a second time and ignored what Crosby said because I saw that. I think it may have actually been in the background of another scene in another episode. I don't know. But, I didn't see um, it. But... But you can see it much more clearly uh, yeah. in this one. But to me, I, you know, again, if that was something that was true, fine. But it just didn't didn't really need to be. Yeah. It was to me that whole scene could have been more about Rosenthal, his return home. They could have even had him talking about whether this happened in real life or not, about seeing the the dead Jews. You know, they didn't even mm -hmm. he didn't come home, and you don't see anything with him going, "Hey, by the way, I saw this thing. It's a concentration <laughs> camp." You know, there's no just so you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. and. Oddly enough, you, too, gave, you never see what great, happens to Tom. Crosby's girlfriend in the uh, episode either. But Right. Yeah, it's true. You gave away the Easter eggs. So there are people can Sorry. go back and look for me. Um, all right. So they, they just briefly about the tent city 
POW camp there, they commented that uh, I can't, I didn't write down the number, but something like it was built for 8,000 and there were a hundred thousand yes. in there. Um, and, and it was, you know, just a horrible, horrible place. I can believe that. Um, yeah. and so th then the war's over. It's that easy, right? <laughs> so, well, there, there, there's a lot, there's a lot there that happens that doesn't happen. Um, so mm -hmm. to to clarify what you were saying, Mooseburg was uh, a, was supposed to be a smaller prisoner war camp, and they had over a hundred thousand human beings in there. And what they did show is that they had a bunch of different nationalities in there, and that's also true. Now, how many were there? You know, I have no freaking clue, but uh, it became kind of a catch-all. You know, like a gumbo pot, honestly, of, of POWs because the Germans were just herding them there, literally. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a big scene that they show at the end, towards the end of this, two things happen that don't happen. One. You're talking about the flag? Yeah. Egan does not do that, by the way. Just spoiler alert. Uh, they literally had a conversation with our uh, curator not an hour ago and he looked it up and he found the guy's name told me his name and it's gone right out of the back end of my brain but it was most certainly not major john egan who raised the flag over mooseburg two there was no fight like that uh for the mooseburg prison camp and by that i mean like you know the armor rolls up and there's this big fight and firefight and the germans are shooting into the crowd baloney did not happen like that was there mm -hmm. a somewhat of a fight for mooseburg yes was it nearly as dramatic as that and as violent as touch and go no did not happen like that at all mm -hmm. that was just to add dramatic tension to something that frankly didn't need it well one of these armored lieutenant colonels walks up and german guard commander comes over to him and says the camp and the village are yours will i will hand over my men disarmed in 30 minutes you know he, he tries saluting him and he or tries to shake his hand and they end up saluting each other, cheers, and that's pretty much it. Then another P-51 flies over, of course. So, um, <laughs> cut back to Rosie and Buck and Cross. Um, Now they're going to make a, the final flight, which I know did happen, um, and but this one is to drop food. And you'll remember we you know, develop the character of Lemons in one of the early episodes, who's one of the mechanics, and they're going to let him come aboard and, and ride while they drop this food. And Lemons, who has been fixing these airplanes for the entire war, has never flown in a plane before. He came over by ship. He had no reason to fly to B-17 or any other airplane for that matter. And so this is his very first flight ever in the kind of plane he had been maintaining throughout the war. And is that is that true as well? I have no idea if Lemons flew. I would imagine it was a possibility, but I, I mean that I was. Mean, yeah, I would think he did because most of your mechanics, especially, would take the aircraft up test flights and test flight. But over. I don't know if he flew I, I on a Chowhound mission, though. No. I'd have to look it up. I, but I wouldn't believe this is his very first time to ever fly Wait, ever. at this point in the mm -hmm. war. You know, it, it maybe maybe so, but I got to think he took a few flights. Mm -hmm. the, the the thing that was there were two things wrong about this whole scene uh with with operation mana operation chowhound is what is was actually called um is that gail clevin did not fly it nor did robert mm -hmm. rosenthal, rosenthal did not fly those missions at all um so it was a nice touching scene for gail to climb up in the cockpit and rosie to give up the left seat and you know it's an honor and all this other stuff touching never happened didn't happen. Yeah. Nope. There's this thing called proficiency. And so when you've been out of the cockpit for eight or nine months, I can't remember how long he'd been in the POW camp. You don't just oh, climb yeah. back in the airplane. You got to do a whole bunch of training flights first. So yeah, I knew I knew that was nonsense. And then when they do fly the flight, there was another bit that I thought was nonsense. Turns out may not have been. It's they're flying over the Netherlands and there's a windmill and there's tulips and I'm thinking, how on the nose can you be? And carved into the tulips is thanks, Yanks, or many something thanks, like Yanks. that. Yeah. Many thanks. Many Yanks, thanks, Yanks. Yeah. Yep. That actually happened. I saw a photograph. That was yes, it did. they really did that, didn't they? Yes, they did. And that you know that's something I'm I'm glad that to, to, before we get too far down, I'm looking at the mm -hmm. part in the book right now, Clevin. Uh he says, I beg to fly just one last time, for the Germans had rather upset me. 
but they wouldn't let me. They told me our war, the bomber war was over. So I said, the hell with it. Send me home. I've got a girl I want to marry. So mm -hmm. Gail Clevin never flew those missions, but okay. I'm glad that they did include it, even though they had, I get it. You know, they wanted to put our main characters in there and all this other stuff, fine, whatever. But that was an important part of the war for those guys that experienced that. You know, they, the, mm -hmm. the, the eighth called it operation, um, Oh, geez, Chowhound, as I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. and the uh, the Dutch called the American pilot and the British pilots who did it too called them the candy bombers. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a big thing for those guys that flew those missions because instead of taking lives, they were helping to save lives. And that was right. huge. That was huge. And that whole truce with the Germans flying over the any that happened. That that was mm -hmm. that was the that was legitimate. But yeah, Clevin and Rosie flying and nope. Well, the reason the reason they put Clevin in the cockpit is so they could set up the final scene, which is he's trying to get permission to land, and a familiar voice comes over the radio, right. and it's Bucky. He's back from the POW camp, and and he's like that. And they reset up that line that had been established way early in one of the early episodes, which is like a stone in my shoe. I can't get rid of you. So. You know, it was a throwaway line. It was a silly scene, but they have to close it out with everybody who did live, you know, with a warm kind of scene. And 8th of May, band dance, heading home, lowering flags, packing up, all those kinds of things you would expect to happen at the end of the war. And Crosby is, I think, is, is the voiceover narrative where he says, on occasion, the world must confront itself and answer that we are with, we are who we are. We're going home. Uh, just wish more of us were. Again, poignant, yeah, but but they could have done so much better, in my view. And the plain, boy, talk about on the nose. Oh, what a corny way to end and such an important story. The plane flies off into the sunset. You've got to be <laughs> kidding me. Yeah, right. and also, John Egan and Gail Clevin did not fly home together in the same airplane. Just saying. Of course not. Yeah. But anyway, closing credits, I will say they did the the kind of usual thing with the photo of the actor and then the photo of the, the real person with, the, you know, the narrative as to what happened to them. I thought that was very tasteful and extremely well done. The only thing um, I didn't like about it is they didn't feature... Lemons, for example. I mean, you just saw him in this episode, and mm -hmm. he was a pivotal right, character right. early on, but then you don't see him, you know, elsewhere. Right. Yep. Uh, the um, And then the documentary that you already mentioned, Seth, I pulled that up. Yeah, very not familiar face was on there. <laughs> yeah, not knowing that you were in it. The Bloody 100th documentary, narrated by Tom Hanks. And there's... Somebody I know quite well. That's <laughs> interesting that you kept that secret. Did you yeah. keep that secret to, for, to everybody or just me, Seth? No, not everybody. Tommy knew, uh, but I'll be I'll be one hundred percent one hundred percent honest, honest to God. Uh, it came out Thursday night. Um, I knew it was mm -hmm. on there. I did not watch it. I didn't really feel like watching it at that point. I did not know I was in it because Apple is very proprietary. Like I had never seen it. I didn't hear anything. It was alluded to the fact that I was in it. And I honest to God didn't know. Uh, I, I really didn't. I did not know. Well, especially uh, after this podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, hey. I'm surprised they included you. Two different, after, hold the, two different things. Though. So my buddy True. Sean Bergstrom said True. the same thing. He's like, I can't believe they put you in there. I said, hold the phone. Number one. I filmed that in February, 2023. And the documentary is 100% accurate, whereas this is show true. is not. So I wasn't <laughs> yeah. in the show. I was in the documentary, two totally different things. But I just well know done, too. Well done. Until it was Tommy, well sent done. Me a, Tommy sent me a screenshot, and I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm in. <laughs> I did not know. Did not You're know. in there as much or more than Spielberg, at least. Yeah. Well, it was cool. It, yeah, it was, it was, I think it was fun true. doing it. That's, yeah. And, and again, when you did it, you hadn't seen the show True. So you didn't know. What, in fact, and none that's of not what we were there to talk about. Yeah, we were there to talk about yeah, the yeah. guys, the actual guys, and the actual history. Right. So. Well, perfect. Job All well right. done. And if our viewing audience hasn't watched that, they uh, definitely need to go do that now because it's it's cool it's to good. see uh, 
the footage. It's cool to see Seth on there. It's cool to see, you know, the old, the old guys, the ones that were still living and some that have passed, sadly, uh, some of them set quite a few years ago, uh, to see the interviews and, and hear it from their own words and, and not really have any kind of a spin or an agenda to it or anything else. It was, right. it was really well done. Um, Frankly, I wish it had been another hour or two more. I mean, it was what said yeah, an hour long, but about an hour. Agreed, it was an hour. Yeah, yeah, it was good whatever. though. They they good. they found they cool. they dug into some archives and found some really good oral yeah. histories that I didn't even know existed. The only yeah. one I knew existed, well, aside from Luckadoo, John L L Lucky Luckadoo, was Joe Armanini. And you're right, Tommy, that is the one that I shot in the studio at the National World War II Museum. But I other than that. um, like in Bob Wolf, I knew Bob Wolf was alive, but they yeah. found a really good one with Rosie and Crosby and Cowboy Roan. I didn't even know he had done an interview. So yeah. they did some yeah. really good digging. They found some really good material. Yeah. And Murphy. And who is the guy? Murphy. Yeah. You know, he's the one with the white beard. Um, that was Crosby. That was Crosby, Crosby. yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, there you go. All right. So, guys, we got a lot of comments on our reviews uh, for prior episodes, and I, and I thought I want, would want to deal with two of them. To the comments specifically for the good news is the vast majority of commenters agree with our reviews. Not that's why we do it, right? And I made the point last episode that we weren't, you know, we clearly we're accused of of sucking up and being fanboys in our reviews of the episodes we really liked. And then the last two episodes where we're pretty critical of those for good reason. Somebody said that. Oh, we're too harsh on them because they filmed it during COVID and they were losing money, all this kind of thing. Let me tell you, folks, I ran several factories during COVID. Nobody gave us a pass, okay? <laughs> You're held to a standard. And COVID is not an excuse that's standard. So I'm not accepting that one. Yeah, it was going to cost them more money because it cost, it cost the whole world more money. Either you do a good job or you don't. And so I'm sorry. Uh, what do you guys think about the COVID excuse? You know, I will say this. I'll say this about uh, Apple um, TV or whatever you want to call it. Productions. I don't know. Um, they were all about the COVID thing, man. Because like I told you, I filmed that documentary back in February of 2023. And before they would even allow me to come within a thousand miles of New York City, I had to take a friggin' COVID test in my front lawn <laughs> on a Wednesday night at about eight o'clock. I swear to God mm -hmm. in 2023, they were still paranoid about that. And I'm not going to get into a political mm -hmm. discussion about that because I could go on for four hours, but regardless of this, I can see why they say that. And I can, I'm sure it did cost them money, but mm -hmm. to your point, Bill, 100%, you still got to hold up your end of the bargain. And, you know, it was very evident that, that the last, Three episodes were rushed, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They added too much stuff in there, and they ran out of time to talk about it all. I mean, the fact that you spend episode eight, half of it, setting up the Tuskegee Airmen that, you know, didn't even fly in the same damn zone. And then you go mm -hmm. into episode nine, and I think Jefferson has, like, you know, a couple of lines, and that's in Macon, maybe a couple, yeah. and then that's it. It's yeah, like, they shake hands mm -hmm. with a couple of people and they scream and wave at the Mustangs that fly around. And that's yeah. kind of all they do in the episode. That's it. Yep. Know? But, you know, whatever. It is what it is. <laughs> you know, th that's going to be the excuse for everything. Hell, I'm still get that when my pizzas are late. Well, you know, we're shorthanded. Eh, whatever. Because but, of COVID. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, What was the other one? Bill? All right. The other one was the comment on, uh, you know, where we criticized the cause co covering Crosby's affairs and a commenter said well Crosby's affairs humanize him and I, I had no argument they absolutely do humanize him but the, here's the issue this is kind of flies flies in the face of the COVID argument you got a limited amount of time to spend in these nine episodes on the subject of the strategic bombing campaign in Europe and you have a limited amount of budget the more you squeeze into that time and budget that's not germane to this, the heroism of the guys that you're trying to represent, you do them a disservice. So the question then becomes one of priority, not one of humanitizing somebody. It is, 
you've established a priority where that guy's affair is more important than these dudes who died. And that's the issue I have with it. Guys? Well, I'm just going to make one comment on that. The damn Germans got nothing to do with this. So if you know what I'm talking about, you said it's not germane to the situation. <laughs> Kelly's <laughs> heroes. Regardless. Uh, <laughs> Carol O'Connor. Anyway. Um, um, I I agree. They, I, you know, I think we've, we've, we've said this multiple times and they spent too much time on frivolous stuff mm -hmm. and when they should have, because there was a hell of a lot of war that they skipped over for various reasons and decisions and whatever, i.e. D-Day uh, and the Hundreds role in that and the subsequent days afterwards, which were rather busy. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that they missed. Um, and, you know, whatever. I, that's a lot of war. It, it's a very daunting mm -hmm. topic to cover quickly and uh, in, in nine hours or 10 hours, you know, but yeah, I think I agree with you, Bill. I, I think they, they could have eliminated a lot of the frivolous stuff, concentrated more on the stuff that really matters. And this series would have been a lot, lot, lot better than it was. Yeah. Agree. Tommy? Yeah, I, um, I find it funny, too. You know, they didn't even really reference it, but Rosie went down a whole other time, too. If I remember mm -hmm. correctly, landed in France. You know, there's a whole other story arc there. And yeah, in 44 that you could have... Uh, done more with if you weren't showing Crosby in the sheets or, you know, there's so many other mm -hmm. things, storylines, you know, a lot of these characters they developed in seven, eight, and even in nine, they could have developed earlier in the season or earlier in the series, excuse me, uh, to make you a little bit more uh, vested in their storyline or, or in the emotion that they were trying to, I think, convey with some of them. It was, it was lost. It was, and then, yep. and then, you know, to do spend all that time uh, with Crosby's girlfriend, and then it's just this throwaway. Oh, by the way, she's undercover spy, whatever. Notice she only see her in the final episode. Yeah, no. And there's so many other things that they introduced, and in, and in especially seven and eight that they just left mm -hmm. hanging, and in other episodes too. I mean, there's there's lots of of uh, hanging threads, even by episode nine. I feel like they needed another couple of episodes to really uh, tie this up the way they should have, and and. Or maybe they didn't need that. And maybe they, like as Bill said, needed to focus more with the, with even with the COVID stuff, uh, with, you know, if time is money, then put your money in the right place and, and do the right thing exactly. and not worry about all this extracurricular stuff. So, yeah. um, and, you know, overall for me, I thought it was a good series. Uh, I hesitate from saying great. I mean, I, I think I will rewatch it at some point, but it won't be as frequently as I would watch, say, you know, another show, another movie or something else. But for me too, it was impactful to, uh, yeah, the Pacific, there you go. Um, for me, it was cool to watch because I got a little bit of skin in the game, at least with my family. Uh, and I alluded to this, I think a little bit in the first episode, but you know, I had a cousin who was flying what would have been possibly his last mission or next to last mission, uh, who was flying the B-17 Mississippi mission. 390th bomb group which they reference the 390th quite a bit in this series same, especially in yeah, the first third bomb division yeah yeah same division pretty close to each other as far as bases go to and and so um uh geographically speaking so you know gerald's 14 january 1945 something y'all were both talking about at the start of this episode and i sort of bit my tongue to save it for the end is and i think you know it was sort of that that line, if I remember correctly, where uh, they're discussing that, you know, we control the skies or whatever in February of 45. Not the case. That was one of the last major push uh, efforts of the Luftwaffe, 14 January 1945. He was flying over Durban, Berlin Durban raid. Um, they were actually approached by Fock Wolf, shot in the tail section. Most of his crew, a uh, tail gunner to start with, was killed. Um and what was hard for me to see at the beginning of this episode was when Rosie's trying to get out of the aircraft and the G forces keeping him pinned in and everything else, because it's my understanding from after action reports and the crew interviews, uh, the plane eventually catches fire. My cousin just before that is yelling out to the navigator. I think it is forget who it was specifically, uh, which position, where's the formation. And they say something like, sir, we are the formation. Uh, they end up, uh, catching on fire, he ends up telling everyone to bail out and holds the control uh, control steady so that all the men could get out that were living. But unfortunately, the aircraft went down in such a dive and into a spin that Gerald couldn't get out of the airplane. Uh, so he rode that thing all the way to the ground to his death. 
with other members of his crew dead inside as well. Um, and there's another story I want to look into a little bit more that maybe one of his other crew members had actually given away his parachute. Uh, I still need to kind of confirm some of that with, with records and, and uh, other means. But um, what's cool for me is approaching this series, I was hoping to, and, and feel like I did get a better understanding and appreciation for his loss, uh, but for his service mm -hmm. as well. And he flew Chow Hound mission to Poland, got a, an award from the Polish government for that. Um, you know, and, and what else has been kind of cool is that if you ever make your way down to South Mississippi and get close to Camp Shelby, we actually have pieces of the Mississippi mission. A few years ago, they actually found in Germany, uh, a tree fell over, uprooted some pieces. They found pieces of the aircraft, were able to confirm there were no remains left. Everyone had been accounted for. And uh, when Gerald died, he had a 16-month-old son at that time, Wayne. And so uh, some of the German individuals at the German government uh, sent the pieces of the Mississippi mission to Wayne, and Wayne donated those to our museum. So we actually have here on display pieces of the b-17 mississippi mission um uh, ironically in the days before this series aired as well wayne that was 16 month old son actually passed away before he got the chance to see this but he died on 14 january of this year the same anniversary as his father was killed in action which is of course his hero uh his entire mm -hmm. life you know growing up without a father but saw his father as a hero so for me approaching this, you know, some may argue or even on the saying comments, I was being a little too critical here and there on some of this stuff, but get it right. You know, there's there's so many thousands of other Americans who've lost loved ones in this war, but especially flying in B-17 service and B-24s and B-25s and, you know, all, in the air war in general. Uh, we lost so many people, fighters, bombers and otherwise, that this is your chance to memorialize them and make them the heroes that they are and they deserve to be. And I feel like you kind of missed the mark in a few areas, but I'm glad they at least did the series and put the effort uh, into making this happen. And I'm glad people like Rosie Rosenthal are household names now where uh, maybe they could have potentially been lost to history if we weren't, you know, making something like this. Well, Tommy, your cousin was a real hero. And and again, yeah, it just kind of makes it even worse when you think about the fact that they the, the producers cared more about uh Crosby's affair than your cousin, about than <laughs> than the Tuskegee Airmen, than a whole bunch of other stories that could have been included. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Seth. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say this. After it was over, after I watched the la last episode Friday, Friday night. Friday night, Saturday, whenever I sent you a message, Tommy, I don't remember anymore. Um, I said it was a great seven part series. <laughs> and I, I stand by that statement. Uh, the first yeah. six, six episodes I thought were good. They, they had their problems as we discussed ad nauseum, um, but mm -hmm. they were good. You know, they were good. Episode six is still my favorite one. The, the one about the emotional toll. I, I still say that that was one of the finest displays of that I've ever seen on screen. Um, outstanding uh the Munster raid episode was very good the regensburg raid was that very good um i liked this last episode i thought they wrapped it up good they had some historical inaccuracies which we've discussed here um made some stuff up frankly i understand why they did it i'm not giving them a pass because they did it but i understand why um but i agree same thing that you guys have said they spent too much time on frivolous junk that they didn't need to that they missed the opportunity to completely tell the story that being said would i watch this again yeah some will i watch the whole series again no i would not watch seven and eight if you put a gun to my head uh, that's being a bit ridiculous mm -hmm. but no honest to god i i wouldn't um would i watch this last one again yeah probably but, you know, the ones that I mentioned specifically, yes, I would. I've seen the Pacific multiple times. I've seen Band, Bandwagon of Brothers several times. Um, so, I mean, it's those are very watchable. And parts of this are as well. Um, it was good. It was not great. It was good. That's my opinion. Yeah. So I saw a com I saw an interview uh, where John Orloff, the showrunner, writer, um, commented that is the the episode he was the most proud of was episode nine so the one he's the most proud of contained in my view the most fiction 
That's an interesting comment. Yep, I would agree um, with that. You know, so it, it, I get that you want a happy ending, kind of quasi happy ending. How could it be a happy ending when all these guys died? A poignant ending might have been better. So that's my first comment. The second thing is, in many cases, the true history was more gripping, more dramatic, more, you know, in your face, more unbelievable than the made up history that they inserted into these episodes. So why would somebody, and this has happened to the USS Indianapolis story as well. So I've commented on that uh, separately. So why would writers make stuff up and replace things that are actually more gripping with stuff that's not as gripping? The only reason is because they think they're smarter than they really are. And that happens a lot in this um, industry. And so they, they love their concept of how it should have gone better than how it really went. And they become blind to the true drama of what really happened. Because they're going to improve yeah. the history with their, with their modification of what happened. And, and I and know that, there's going to be comments happened. that people are going to say, this is not a documentary. I get it. And there's a very good documentary you can watch that uh, does accompany this. But Correct. you're right, Bill. I mean, I think there's a lot of chances they could have used the actual history and actually gotten just as much or even better drama than what they made up uh, for the series, you know. It's. Mm -hmm. I get they made some decisions for for dramatic license, you know, poetic dramatic license, whatever. But uh, there's there's still some stuff I think they could have done right, even though it is a drama and not a documentary. Oh, one so, more, one more before we wrap sure. this up. One more mm -hmm. comedic comment. Damn, there were a lot of mustaches in this show. <laughs> Good God! <laughs> did John Egan have yeah. a mustache? Yes, he did. But. He did. Again, if you go back, and also John Egan also only flew what Tommy eight nine missions, so I mean, he wasn't a regular everyday pilot. Right, and that it was a kind of said, thin mustache, you know. Yeah, it was like, like the Errol Flynn one. Yeah, it was the Errol <laughs> Flynn <laughs> mustache. No, he did yeah. not. And the reason that these guys, I don't again the the ridiculous amount of mustaches, I don't get it. You know, I don't know if, if they were trying to be very forties or whatever. But again, the uh, air crewman be they enlisted officers or whatever, did not have a mustache or any kind of facial hair. Quite the opposite. They would shave multiple times a day to keep their baby face as long as they could because the oxygen mask would rub them the raw. Yes. Yep. So that was something, you know, we've made multiple in the office here, funny comments about, but I mean, missed the mark on that way off is that... Mm -hmm. Never happened, man. I mean, I were there guys that had the, Yeah, uh, they were. But, I mean, the vast majority of cats did not do that. The dance I sequence. Expected. I noticed that in the dance sequence in the in episode nine. It was like, mm. you know, I don't know. Half half the men, it felt like in the room, had dead gum mustaches. And I'm like, what is this, a Clark Gable tie thing or, or, or what? <laughs> I don't know. But it was like, man, you know, you almost need a bar seat at the uh, a bar stool with the bar there for your mustache to sit next to you and drink with you or something. <laughs> There's so many of them in there. I'll I'll take a table for two, Tommy, one for me and Jimmy one for Buffett. Mustache. Yeah, Jimmy Buffett's song, I Wish I Had a Pencil Thin Mustache to be playing in the background. Well, yeah, those things are really about hard to maintain. <laughs> and Bucky didn't have one. So it's, I agree. That it is comedic. But uh, yeah, I don't think we've made any friends. So here's the here's my final <laughs> closeout, handing it back over to you. Um, I really, 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 did I say really? wanted to like this show i was leaning into it really hard well i wasn't looking for things to criticize and and for for six episodes i did and then it lost me and the the final episode was okay like you said seth it wasn't enough to pull it out of the, the nosedive from, from my point of view but it, it recovered somewhat <laughs> maybe it was just a flat spin uh, so, you know, it, it was, it was, it, I get that they were under a lot of pressures and the, the, the bad thing about this is I think a lot of these mistakes were avoidable with that, Seth, I hand it back over to you. Yeah. I'll just say, I've seen a lot of, a lot of shows talking about this show where they've, they're, they're, they're 
seems like they're booking for a role in another movie or something like that. And we certainly did mm -hmm. not do that. So that yeah, is what it is. So with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. If you want to see a video version of this, check us out on YouTube. If you got a question or comment, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Perrin. Thank you very much for listening and or watching to these Masters of the Air reviews. Make sure you still tune in to our regular Pacific shows, which, by the way, have not stopped. And Tommy, thank you very much, my brother, for being here with us. And uh, we're definitely going to get you involved in some future things as we go along, because I think this yeah. has uh, been a pretty damn good uh, <laughs> chemistry here, if I do say yeah. so myself. Uh, thank you all for letting me be a part of this. This has been fun. Even when it hasn't been fun, it's been fun. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, pleasure. Indeed. Bill, take us home. Uh, we won't see you next week on the review, but we'll see you tomorrow for a regular show. Indeed.